Is this little iPhone 12 mini more powerful than this nearly $4,000 behemoth MacBook Pro? Yes, actually it kind of is. And don't worry, I'm not going to throw this MacBook Pro. I don't know where you'd get that idea from. There's really no denying that this has been way more important to Apple than this for the last couple of years. But now Apple is looking to go back to the Mac, refocus their attention on their laptop and desktop line, but also bring some iPhone DNA back with them. In this video, I kind of want to talk about the future of Apple, how these products are changing, why the Apple M1 processor is so important, and why any Apple product you buy today and in the future is never going to be the same again. And a huge thanks to Clean My Mac X for sponsoring this video. So before we really jump into things, let me just say right at the top that I'm not spending a lot of time in this video going over the really nitty gritty technical details of the M1 processor. Apple has already done that. Quite frankly, they've done it better than I ever could. But I really want to focus on what you, the end user, the consumer, the one spending your hard earned money to buy one of these Macs can expect and what's going to be different on an M1 Mac that you wouldn't get on an Intel Mac from years past. And basically, Apple is taking the big lessons they've learned from making chips for the iPhone, the iPad, the Apple Watch, Apple TV, all their other different Apple devices in their ecosystem, taking those big lessons and now applying those to the Mac, essentially giving you the best possible performance while also making those devices as efficient as possible. And those are some pretty bold claims. You're going to have a laptop that is thin, lightweight, a performance powerhouse while also having amazing battery life. It sounds really honestly too good to be true. Let's see if it really is. So we have one of the first iPhone inspired Apple Silicon devices here in house to actually test. It's the new 2020 MacBook Air. And inside this has Apple's M1 processor. And I really wanted to kind of put this thing through its paces, run some tests and see what it's really like to use one of these laptops and see just how different it is from its Intel counterpart. And I'll tell you right off the bat, it looks exactly the same to a MacBook Air with an Intel chip inside. And I know this might be to the dismay may have some people, there is no big redesign here. We we're all hoping for face ID, slim bezels, maybe some kind of new industrial design that would change from generation to generation. But unfortunately, we didn't get that. So if you can put kind of those you know, sad feelings aside for a little bit and just focus on what you have. You do have a really nice computer. The MacBook Air has a fantastic design. It's got an excellent trackpad. It's got a really nice keyboard. And dare I say, it is nice to not have a touch bar. Is that almost a feature these days? Because having the physical function keys to control volume and brightness and all that stuff is honestly my preferred method over the touch bar. I actually think it's really nice to not have the touch bar on the MacBook Air. You're just getting a really nice and a very premium Mac experience. And really, since the MacBook Air made its world debut by sliding out of that manila envelope on a stage in 2008, it's really been the Mac focused on uh, giving you a great Mac OS experience in a thin and lightweight package. It wasn't really focused on performance or power. It didn't necessarily even have crazy good battery life, but it was a nice way to get a really great Mac, a mobile Mac, for uh, not a super you know expensive amount of money. The MacBook Air has definitely come down in price over the years and has been a great starter Mac. But now the narrative is kind of getting flipped a bit because with this M1 processor inside of this new MacBook Air, this thing is also now a mini powerhouse. So let's compare the Apple M1 processor inside of the new MacBook Air to a couple other products in the Apple family. I wanna see how it compares and stacks up to the A14 Bionic in the iPhone 12 mini, the cheapest you know, iPhone 12 flagship you can buy these days. I also wanna take a look at the A12Z inside of the iPad Pro, and then also my current workhorse, the i9 equipped 16 inch MacBook Pro. This thing is nearly maxed out. It's spec to the gills. It's got 32 gigs of RAM and it costs a whopping $3,500 to buy from Apple, which is basically like buying three MacBook Airs and still having money left over uh, if you were to go and buy the machine I have spec behind me. So I really wanted to see how all of these machines compared and if Apple Silicon in the MacBook Air and more specifically in their other devices really outperforms the crazy i9 equipped laptop that I have sitting behind me on my desk. 
So I'm not really one to do a whole lot of synthetic benchmarks, but I did kind of want to get a baseline test on all the devices across the board. So of course I went to good old Geekbench and ran some tests on all the different Apple devices with their different processors inside to see how they fare. So looking first at the single core performance, very interesting that the M1 in this base MacBook Air with no cooling system was nearly double the performance of the i9 in my nearly maxed out MacBook Pro. So far, not having a lot of confidence in that nearly $4,000 MacBook Pro. Jumping down to multi-core performance, you can see the A12Z in the iPad and the A14 Bionic in the iPhone 12 mini were pretty close, almost uh, very neck and neck, but they both pale in comparison to the i9 in my MacBook Pro. But then the M1 comes back and tops it all again, beating my i9 in my MacBook Pro. And in fact, there's actually a bigger takeaway here based off of some of the wider Geekbench results we've seen floating around online and other performance tests other users have done. The M1 in these different Apple Silicon and Max is pretty much outperforming all other Intel Macs currently available. I think only kind of flanked by some of the higher end Mac Pros and I think the iMac Pro. But in terms of all Apple laptops, the M1 is kicking butt, taking names and doing a fantastic job, beating out computers double, triple, and in some cases quadruple their price. But as good as the synthetic tests are in giving us a good baseline of different computers with different chipsets against other computers kind of running a standardized test, uh, they really don't tell the whole story because you're not sitting there running benchmarks all day, you're actually doing work. And for me, a lot of my work and a lot of my day is consumed by video editing. I edit a lot of video inside of Final Cut Pro. So my first test was a six minute 4K video project from over on the John Rettinger channel. This was a good mix of 4.6K A-roll with 4K B-roll with a color grid on there, some screen captures, and a couple little effects. Nothing super crazy, but nothing super simple either. I was really curious to see how the M1 would perform with this pretty standard project I think you'd see in uh, different video post-production houses, or definitely if you're a YouTuber creating 4K content, this is a very standard project, again, about six minutes, and I wanted to see how these two machines would kind of stack up. And my i9 MacBook Pro did that export in about seven minutes and eight seconds. Not bad at all, a very respectable time, and pretty typical from the performance I've seen out of that machine. The M1 processor, though, did that same exact export in almost a minute and a half less, clocking in at five minutes and 26 seconds to do that exact same export. And beyond just that, I gotta tell you the performance of Final Cut Pro on this M1 processor was really surprising. Not only did a fan never spin up, it was silent because there's no fan inside, but I could scrub through this 4K timeline with no issue, even turning on better uh, playback resolution inside of Final Cut to uh, get the maximum quality. The experience was, for lack of a better word, like buttery smooth. I was super impressed. Even my MacBook Pro drops a few frames or has some limitations sometimes when it comes to projects like this. The MacBook Air was incredibly impressive to do, and you could not do the same thing on an older MacBook Air with an Intel chip inside. This M1 is doing the heavy lifting, and it's doing a really impressive job. Before we continue, let me take a quick break to talk about your Mac. Now, whether you're looking to buy one of these new Apple M1 equipped Macs, or you're looking to take your existing Mac and upgrade it to Big Sur, uh, there is never a bad time to make sure your Mac is safe, secure, well-optimized, free of junk, and just kind of running in tip-top shape, kind of like you took it out of the box yesterday. To do that, we're gonna use the tool from this video sponsor, Clean My Mac X. Personally, there are a lot of reasons I use and recommend Clean My Mac X to other Mac owners, but I think it really comes down to three things Clean My Mac X does really well. It's going to scan your entire system and remove a lot of the junk, log, and cache files that are actually taking up a lot more space than you'd think on your system and allow you to reclaim that space on your drive. It's also gonna do a malware check. It's gonna check for any security vulnerabilities, any viruses, and it's also going to do a deep scan and show you any large files, any old files that are taking up space that probably you should clear off, delete now, and reclaim some very precious space on your Mac's internal drive. Clean My Mac X is made to keep your Mac safe, secure, well-optimized, and it's actually loaded with a bunch of features that you can't really do in Mac OS by itself. For example, one of my favorites is the ability to select one app or multiple apps and automatically delete those applications and all their little remnants and all the files that go along with them simply with one click. I think Clean My Mac X is one of those must-have applications if you own a 
Mac. I use it on all the Macs I have behind me to make sure they're safe, secure. Again, I can remove all those junk files super easily and I can make some of my older Macs feel like they're new again. Like that iMac over there is like six years old, but Clean My Mac X helps it kind of feel like it's fresh and new again. Anyways, I definitely recommend you check it out. We're gonna leave a link to it down below. So check it out for yourself and learn more about Clean My Mac X. Next, I wanted to do another video export test, but I wanted to try it across all the different devices. But unfortunately, Final Cut Pro is not on the iPad or the iPhone just yet, uh, but this is actually a good excuse for me to use LumaFusion. This is a great editing program that's on the iPad, it's on the iPhone, and also is on the Silicon Macs as well. And I don't know if this is the M1 uh, specific version of LumaFusion. I don't know if it's optimized for that processor yet, or if this is just the iOS port, but nonetheless, it does work on this new MacBook Air with the M1 processor inside. And I think the results either way really do speak for themselves. So for this test, I took a nearly nine minute 4K video file, a finished exported file from Final Cut, and put it into LumaFusion on the iPad, the iPhone, and the Apple M1. And I did an export test at the ultra quality, best possible settings that this program was capable of. And here's kind of where the results got very interesting. The iPhone 12 mini with the A14 Bionic inside exported that nearly nine minute 4K video in seven minutes and 41 seconds. Certainly not bad at all, very respectable. The iPad Pro with the A12Z, a little bit better. Clocking in at a little over six minutes at six minutes and nine seconds. But then comes the MacBook Air with its M1 performance, which can do that export in five minutes and 21 seconds. That's nearly two minutes better than the A14 Bionic and a good 30 to 45 seconds better than the A12Z in the iPad Pro. Needless to say whether or not LumaFusion is optimized for Apple Silicon or if this is just an iOS port, whatever the case might be, these are super impressive results that really, again, showcase just the sheer raw power of this M1 processor. Exporting 4K videos is not really a big problem or a big challenge for this Apple Silicon chip. And it's weird to wrap your head around it because you always think of needing the best processor, the most amount of RAM, the best GPU to do any kind of 4K video editing. But again, even in Final Cut and a professional uh, project file loaded in there with 4.6K footage and uh, color grading and stuff like like that, uh, this just ran super simply and very effortlessly on this MacBook Air with an M1 processor, eight gigs of RAM, an integrated GPU, and no fan whatsoever. I was just, again, super blown away by this and it's kind of changing the narrative. Again, you always think you need the very best to do 4K video editing and you need the very best to do any kind of professional stuff. And I think that the Apple M1 processor is starting to prove us wrong in a way. Another cool feature, which is sort of a party trick right now, is that the M1 processors can run iOS apps, which is really cool. But I'll tell you, after trying and kind of playing around with a couple, even ones that Apple kind of prominently showcased in the App Store, they're not really optimized yet. I tried the Crossy Road game and it still really wants you to touch your finger on the screen and use gestures. It works on the trackpad, but it definitely is begging for some kind of touch input. It's not really meant to work with a trackpad just yet. I also tried HBO Max, which uh, doesn't resize at all. It seems like it's almost kind of running in like an emulator. It won't resize, it won't scale up. It again, thinks you're touching the screen and navigating around, though it does work on the Mac, it doesn't really work as well as it should. I expect these to hopefully be updated in the near future, but as of right now, that feature is there, but it's not super useful just yet, really depending on the app you're trying to use. Okay, so what are the big takeaways? Why does all this matter? And why is the M1 so important? What does it tell us about the future of Apple? Well, I think first things first, just kind of initial impressions, I am incredibly impressed with the M1 inside of this new MacBook Air. The fact that it whooped the butt of my i9 MacBook Pro in multiple tests uh, really shows the power of this processor. And I also think that it really goes to show the power of other Apple Silicon chips, the A12Z, the A14 Bionic. You are more than welcome and really more than capable of using an iPad Pro or an iPhone to edit video. Load up LumaFusion, edit some 4K video, and you have very respectable uh, export time again with no fan ever spinning up. These devices are super fast and also super capable. Again, also remember that this is just the beginning of Apple's transition to their own silicon. They were very specific to say that this is just the beginning of their new family of chips. I can't wait to see what the silicon is gonna be like inside of the new 16 inch MacBook Pro or a higher end iMac or a Mac Pro. Again, if this is just the beginning of what we're gonna see, then I'm kind of expecting to be blown away by what's coming next because uh, if this is a sign of what's to come, then it's very, very impressive. 
And I guess the last question is, should you buy one of these new Apple Silicon Macs? Is now the time to jump onto an Intel bandwagon, buy an Intel Mac when you can, because once this transition goes, it's going to affect all the Macs and you're kind of going to be out of luck. Uh, I don't think so. I think that these chips are so good and the transition has been smooth so far. And it's been so encouraging that I really don't have any reservations or hesitations recommending one of these chips. I think the only use case I can think of is if you have some kind of really mission critical custom Intel application that you cannot afford for it to not work 100% of the time, 100% perfectly with no kind of translation or buffer layer in between, then maybe you should go with an Intel Mac to be safe. But again, in my testing, I couldn't find an app that didn't work. Rosetta 2 did an excellent job translating all apps to work fine on the M1. And the performance was just really, really good. The performance, the scalability of the performance, the battery life and the efficiency was so good that there really just is no downside with going with one of these new Apple Silicon equipped Macs. The M1 is just really good. So what do you guys think of the Apple Silicon Max? The M1 is super impressive and uh, I cannot wait to see what is coming next. Uh, but what are your thoughts? Have you gotten one of these new Macs? What are your thoughts? Are you excited to make the transition? Are you hesitant? Is there something that we didn't answer in this video that you'd like to see in an upcoming video? Or what would you really like to see from an upcoming Mac? Is a redesign more important or are you all about more performance and better battery life? Leave a comment down below. We can talk about it and discuss down there. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. I am Robert Rosenfeld from the Apple Circle, and I'll see you in the next one.